Good morning. The first item of business is general questions, and at question number one, I call Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Five, Five Health and Social Care Partnership, and Five Council regarding winter pressures. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary met with Fife Council, NHS Fife and the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership in April and May of this year to discuss winter pressures. He also convened a meeting with all local and health authorities and all health and social care partnerships on the issue in October of 2022. In addition, Scottish Ministers meet Directors of Health and Social Care monthly, most recently on the 14th of November. Annabel Ewing. I, I thank the Minister for his answer and I would take this opportunity to praise our hard-working frontline social care staff. However, the fact of the matter is that as we approach the key winter months, care packages are simply not being arranged timelessly by those responsible in Fife Council, with consequential longer stays in hospital, extremely lengthy waits for vital adaptations and much stress and anxiety for vulnerable individuals and their families being caused. Will the Minister, given the very serious situation in Fife, undertake to raise this matter today with the Chief Executive of Fife Council to ask him to explain what on earth is going on? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. There are many areas in the country at the moment that are currently experiencing a shortage of care at home capacity uh, due to annual leave, sick absence and long-standing recruitment and retention issues, issues which we are helping partnerships work through. I am quite happy uh, to write to Fife Council and the Health and Social Care Partnership, uh, given uh, what Ms Ewing has said here today, uh, and will uh, get back to her uh, with their response. Can I assure the Chamber that the Cabinet Secretary and I are meeting with partnerships, with councils and with boards on a regular basis to ensure that we do our level best for everyone during the course of this winter. And I too uh, would like to put in record my thanks uh, to all of the health and social care staff across the country who are working so hard at this moment. Willie Rennie. I, I don't think the letter to the council really is going to cut it. I mean, social care in Fife is in absolute crisis. I have one constituent who was stuck in hospital, who wanted to go home, but was being pressurised to go and live in a care home that they didn't want to move to because there was no social care packages in place. And that case is not isolated. It's all over Fife. When is the Minister going to get a grip? Minister. President officer, uh, we are doing all that we can to help with the pressures that are on right across the country at this moment. Uh, we are still in a pandemic period. There is a huge amount of pressure on our NHS and our social care system. Uh, there is greater frailty and acuity uh, of folks at this moment in time, uh, which I think we all have to recognise. Uh, what I would say to Mr Rennie and to others across the chamber, um, that if folks want to bring uh, cases to my attention, we will follow up and look at them. As I said, we are uh, engaging uh, with local government, with the health uh, and social care partnerships and the boards on a regular basis. If we know about these uh, scenarios, uh, then we will check on them and see what can be done to alleviate some of the difficulties that folks have faced. Do require uh, more concise questions and responses. I call Ros McCall. Thank you. I'll try and be as concise as possible. Um, the medical practice High Valley Field West Fife closed in 2017. Uh, NHS Fife took over running it, but unfortunately uh, have tried to fill the GP post but have been unable to with 4,000 patients in Kouras, New Mills and Torreyburn without a, a main GP. Uh, as winter approaches, can the Cabinet uh, Secretary explain what provision will be put in place to cover seasonal need on this already pitiful situation? Minister. Um, President officer, I'm not aware of uh, the High Valley Field situation. Um, as the members are aware, uh, GPs come under the Cabinet Secretary's responsibility and not mine. Uh, so I will take uh, her question and respond to her uh, in writing around about the situation there, uh, rather than give a false narrative here today. Question number two, Emma Roddick. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has made an assessment of the impact of carbon offset schemes on rural depopulation. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. 
The Scottish Government is committed to taking action to ensure that increasing levels of natural capital investment in Scotland deliver benefits for rural communities and wider society, in line with just transition principles and our land reform objectives. This commitment is set out in more detail in our Interim Principles for Responsible Investment in Natural Capital, which was published in March this year, and sits within the context of our wider population strategy, a Scotland for the Future, with its actions such as establishing the establishment of a Scottish Rural Community Immigration Pilot. Emma Roddick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Private investment in natural capital may be helpful in enabling the action required to fulfil our ambitions on addressing climate change, but it must be responsible and take full cognisance of the needs of surrounding communities. Can he set out how the Scottish Government will ensure the voices of local communities are heard as we leverage private investment in addressing the climate crisis to ensure that this is pursued in accordance with our land reform ambitions? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, in our uh, national strategy for economic transformation, uh, we set out very clearly that we will develop a high integrity, values led market uh, for uh, responsible investment in natural capital. And by values led, we mean that it's a market that supports our commitment to community engagement and benefit and also to adjust transition. Now, to achieve this, uh, the, we are going to be working with communities and with market stakeholders uh, to promote and also strengthen the existing interim principles that were published earlier this year. Uh, and that is by developing best practice through projects just such as the HIE and Argyll and Butte Council project on carpet, carbon markets and also community wealth building and also by making links to our land reform policies and legislation in the forthcoming years. Mercedes Vialba. We'll never reverse rural depopulation without tackling the centuries-old inequality of land ownership in Scotland. So instead of promoting carbon offsetting for a wealthy elite, isn't it time that the Scottish Government introduce a land cap so that our natural resources work for the many, not the few? Cabinet Secretary. Prime Officer, the member will be aware that we are going to be bringing forward uh, land reform legislation in this parliamentary session in order to make sure that we have robust measures in place for the way in which land is managed in Scotland. And no doubt these will be some of the issues which we will debate during the course of that Bill's passage in Parliament. Question number three, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its progress with plans to replace industrial injuries disabled benefit. Minister Ben McPherson. The Scottish Government has continued to successfully deliver new and complex benefits in challenging circumstances, an achievement acknowledged by Audit Scotland in their Social Security Progress Report published in May. We intend to update Parliament early next year on the timetable for further benefit delivery, including the replacement of Industrial Injuries Scheme uh, with Employment Injury Assistance. Marie McNair. Is the Minister aware of the DWP decision to close the UK office that processes industrial injuries disablement benefit has caused significant concerns? These include a worry about the loss of expertise and help for support to those making a claim, many of those who are terminally ill, including those claiming because of mesophilioma. With this benefit transferring to Social Security Scotland, will the Minister meet with me, Clydebank Asbestos Group and others to discuss how the new service should be designed to ensure it meets the needs of applicants? and they get the dignity, fairness and respect that they have been denied by the DWP. Minister. I am concerned by any DWP cutbacks and the potential impact on people that rely on industrial injuries disablement benefits. Uh, Social Security Scotland are, of course, taking a different approach regarding the benefits we are currently delivering, for example, by investing in a local delivery service based in communities across Scotland, which offer advice and support to people applying for assistance. Uh, I am aware of the important support Clyde Bank Asbestos Group provides to people with asbestos-related diseases uh, and their families, and I would be happy to arrange to meet with them with Marie McNair, uh, and I thank her for this suggestion. Question number four, John Mason. To ask the Scottish Government what role car clubs can play in reducing the number of private cars in Scotland's cities. Minister Jenny Gilruth. 
Car clubs are growing from strength to strength in Scotland and have the potential to reduce reliance on private cars and uh, par private car ownership, rather, reducing inequalities and helping to protect our climate. Collaborative Mobility UK's 2021 report found that the average car club vehicle replaces 17 private cars in Scotland. In addition, when considering our commitment to reduce car kilometres travel by 20% by 2030, car clubs can play a role in combination with other interventions to support sustainable travel. John Mason. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? And I wonder if she can update us at all on what progress is being made uh, with the mobility credit scheme and uh, what role car clubs and daily rental vehicles uh, can have in supporting that programme and so reducing the number of private vehicles on the road. Minister. Following the commitment to pilot a mobility and scrappage scheme as part of our work to cut transport emissions, I can advise that work on the design of that scheme and what it might deliver is currently being finalised. The proposed pilot will seek to give direct financial support to lower income households and also to empower them to make different choices about how they travel. I am really keen to give as much ownership uh, of the decisions on this to people taking part in the pilot to make sure that they feel confident that they have the right options to choose from that best meet their travel needs and their interests. That may, of course, include car club membership on the, or the daily rental of a low carbon vehicle alongside public and active transport options. I will be happy to update uh, Mr Mason and Parliament once the pilot scheme proposal is finalised. Graham Simpson. Thank you. I'm glad the uh, Transport Minister recognises the value of car clubs, but uh, they're a bit patchy across the country. So will she commit to doing an audit of all car clubs to see where they are uh, and what their range is? Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Simpson for his supplementary question. I think it's worth pointing out that Transport Scotland do provide assistance to car clubs uh, across the country. And to date, that programme has supported eight community transport vehicles um, worth a value of up to £400,000. There is additional support uh, across the country in relation to uh, how we can better support zero emissions transportation furthermore, but I'm happy to take the member's question away in discussion with Transport Scotland officials in relation to the point he makes. I think it is a valid point. Question number five, Michelle Thompson. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported proposals from the Carnegie Trust to strengthen the national performance framework and make it Scotland's well-being framework. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The national performance framework is Scotland's well-being framework. Increasing well-being is central to its purpose, with the 11 national outcomes setting out the type of country that we want to be. I welcome Carnegie's latest report on the next steps for the MPF and look forward to their engagement as part of the forthcoming review of the national outcomes. Michelle Thompson. I thank the Minister for his response. I'm sure, like me, he welcomes the open letter to the First Minister from 115 charities, businesses and others with suggestions to further our commitment to creating a wellbeing economy. However, the issue of various powers such as employment law being reserved to Westminster is described by Patricia Finlay from the Fair Work Convention as undoubtedly a barrier to our ambitions. Will the Minister ensure in any response to the Carnegie Trust, to the 115 signatories to the open letter, or indeed at the forthcoming Wealth of Nations conference, that it is understood how much of a break in our wellbeing ambitions not being a normal independent country is, and that we seek power for a purpose to make a fundamental shift in people's lives? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I welcome the recent letter calling uh, for a transition to a wellbeing economy. Scotland is leading the way in putting national wellbeing at the heart of our decision making, and I agree that progress is hampered by not having a full range of powers, including employment law, as the member notes. Uh, the National Performance Framework sets out the strategic direction to making progress towards the national outcomes. But this is undermined as the UK government increasingly bypasses devolution yeah. to take public de spending decisions yeah. uh, in a wholly devolved policy area. Uh, this is a fundamental change which undermines a central plank of devolution. Decisions on public spending in devolved policy areas should be taken by the democratically elected Parliament and Government of Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Question number six, Craig Hoy. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to expand rail infrastructure in the south of Scotland region. 
Minister Jenny Gilruth. Our railways help us to meet our strategic transport objectives and the decarbonisation of rail passenger and freight transport will help to cut transport emissions and meet our climate change targets. Additionally, they support our economic and social wellbeing. As the member will know, I recently reopened Reston Railway Station in Berwickshire following a £20 million investment and we are investing £50 million in another new railway station at East Linton in East Lothian. Craig Hoy. The Minister for that answer and I also thank her for a recent meeting at which we discussed these issues. Does she agree with me that to achieve net zero it is vital to provide transport connectivity for areas such as East Lothian, one of the fastest growing in Scotland today? And does she welcome the Rail Action Group East of Scotland's calls for train connection for Haddington? And will she agree to meet with Rages to get Haddington back on track? Minister. Um, I very much agree with the sentiment of Mr Hoy's question. We had a, a very positive meeting last week and he will know that I met with members of the Rages campaign group when I opened Dresden uh, railway station earlier this year. I'd be more than happy to meet with the member and the Rages group more generally to talk about connectivity in relation to the specific issue at Haddington that we discussed last week. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Auditor General of Scotland has said there's the 30% increase in capital costs in Scotland directly as a result of Brexit. Uh, can the Minister advise how this will ex uh, impact on the extending the Borders railway line through Hoyt being beyond. Minister. The Scottish Government have already allocated up to £5 million through the Borderlands Inclusive Deal to assess the benefits and the challenges of extending the Borders Railway, and that funding will be released on the achievement of agreed milestones and in line with the processes that apply to all growth deals. But Christine Graham is absolutely right to point to the inflationary pressures which are currently hampering and challenging a number of capital projects, particularly in, in transport. We know additionally that Brexit has also impacted on the availability of materials and on costs, and so these inflationary pressures are additional. Um, now, the Minister for Business, Trade, Tourism and Enterprise and I met with the Borderlands Partnership on the 6th of October to discuss how to advance the proposed work by partners. Following that, we jointly wrote to the UK Government on the 21st of October to ask that they give urgent consideration to progressing this deal commitment. We now await a response from the UK Government to that urgent letter on the 21st of October and I'd be happy to update the Member and Parliament when we hear more from the UK Government on this important point. Question number seven, Donald Cameron. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure people living in rural communities can access a nearby dentist. Minister Marie Todd. A record number of people are registered with an NHS dentist, more than 95% of the population of Scotland, and across key treatments, NHS dental services are are at uh, comparable levels of activity to levels last seen before pandemic restrictions were introduced. We understand that in certain remote and rural areas, NHS dental access is challenging. That's a historical position which has been exacerbated by Brexit controls, as well as the unique difficulties following the pandemic. We've therefore put in place additional recruitment and retention incentives to maximise the opportunities for newly qualified and trainee dentists to work in areas such as the Highlands. We continue to work with health boards to deliver the responsibility for NHS dental services in their area and we know that the respective health boards are working hard on ensuring that patients continue to have access to NHS dental services. Donald Cameron. Thank you. The Dareda dental practice in Campbelltown is struggling to fill a dentist vacancy and as a result has temporarily ceased providing non-emergency treatments. Its patients now have to make a two and a half hour round trip to Loch Gilped. Will the Minister investigate this urgently and consider including Kintyre on the list of geographical areas that are eligible to apply for the recruitment and retention allowance in order to help this practice attract a new dentist and resume all of its services, allowing people in Campbelltown to access dental treatment in their own community? Minister. Uh, I certainly um, can assure the member that I'm more than happy to look at this issue. We are aware that um, dentists, when they leave practices, the posts are difficult to replace. And as the member indicates, we have um, introduced a, a rural area recruitment uh, retention allowance, which reflects the particular challenges in attracting dentists to work in more remote areas. And I'm more than happy to look at that issue for him. 